I'm going to be talking about London, and these are some of the concepts that have been used uh, and that are used to describe the diverse way in which people in London today live together. And I'm going to try and unpack some of the differences between them and clarify the situation, because there's often quite a bit of confusion about them. Now, <coughs> what we hear a lot about uh, and what we've been hearing a lot about recently are, in, are the anxieties about immigration. Um, people talk about it, the right-wing press has stirred it up, uh, there have been policies that have been anti-immigration, but the reality is that we Londoners, on the whole, live together pretty well. So my story is going to be a rather more optimistic story than the story that's normally uh, focused on. <coughs> in fact, we live together sometimes more comfortably than almost any other city in the Western world. Uh, Kwame Kwe Arma, in a Radio 4 uh, program about London, described London as a city at ease with itself, proud of its diversity, and one that's changed enormously over the last 40 years. And this more optimistic picture is also, of course, the one that was presented to us at the Olympics opening ceremony. I'm going to talk to you a bit one of the things that we were asked to do is make it a bit personal. And I think it's very important for people, for academics, to identify where they're coming from. Because, you know, there's a kind of myth that science, social science, is somehow objective. But of course it isn't. The kind of subjects that people choose are very much based on who we are and how we've grown up. So I'm going to talk a bit about my own situation in order to explain why I'm interested in these issues. So, basically, I'm first-generation British, my father was born in Romania, my mother was born in Amsterdam, my father was Jewish, my mother wasn't, they met in Vienna, uh, they got married, uh, that would have been illegal um, uh, a few years in the 30s, it was, it was in, illegal in Germany, um, and then they came to England, they were let in, they were among the lucky ones, I was born here, and I was, of course, then, if, I'd, if they'd stayed in Austria, where they met, I would have been called a Mischling, which means mongrel, and I would have been liable to uh, be deported to a concentration camp. And I was born here, so I just survived with it. But we spoke, at home we spoke German when I was a child, then I learned Dutch. I was the only person in my primary school who spoke another language at home. It's very different today, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, in my 20s, I married a Mexican, and uh, he was, his mother was of Afro-Mexican descent, his father was half Indian Mexican or indigenous Mexican and Spanish. Uh, we came back here and we had three kids, and because of his background, my kids have become part of the mixed, visibly mixed population of London. And they, in turn, oh, and of course, in Mexico, just let me go back one step, he would have been considered a mestizo, which is the Spanish word for mongrel. Okay, we get here, um, my kids grow up in London, and they in turn marry or live with people from elsewhere. My oldest son's partner is from Iran, the second son lives with a Birmingham-born, half Caribbean, half Pakistani, and the third, uh, <laughs> the third is with someone who came to this country from South Korea. So, you know, it's, it's not perhaps a typical story, but it's not, <laughs> it's not that surprising either. London is like that, and I'll go over some of the... Uh, oh, and yes, my current partner is from uh, a lit fact from South Africa. <laughs> this is how he describes himself. So, none of very little Englishness, but we all live in London, we're all Londoners. Um, okay, now we'll have the slide. Uh, difference is normal. Okay, 35 to 40 percent of Londoners were born outside Britain. We're not just talking about outside London, outside Britain. That's phenomenally high. Okay? I mean, it certainly wasn't the case 50 years ago. Um, at, at least one in, oh, yeah, okay. Um, and 300 languages are spoken by children in different schools. 
Uh, and that's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, you can go to one primary school down the road from you, and they'll probably speak 30 or 40 languages at home, compared with the one, you know, not one when I was a child. And of course, the people, by the way, of course, they include the very rich as well as the very poor. I mean, we're not just talking about the people that are getting, that newspapers are making so much fuss about, people who come here to work for below, uh, uh, you know, pathetic, really dreadful, non-survivable on wages. We're talking about the extremely rich as well as the extremely poor. So across the class spectrum, the, you know, there are... Okay, and now, just to go back to the languages spoken, I mean, there are 400,000 French speakers in London alone. You know, if you go to Kensington, uh, there are a lot of people who speak French as a first language. So we're, not, we're talking about a very wide range of languages as well. Um, okay, uh, and, okay, and people, of course, from different origins, are now very visible in the culture. We have people um, in the media, in the trade unions, in the national health sector, in film, as we've seen this week with the success of Steve McQueen and Chiwetel uh, Ejiofor. Uh, uh, and so people, you know, it's now part of everyday life in London to see high-profile uh, people in high-profile positions. Now, that doesn't mean that racism and xenophobia no longer exist, but only 6% of the population think you need to be white to be British. Anti-racism is now part of the common sense of the nation. It's inscribed in law and in the institutional mission statements, um, for example, of universities, so that my university has a very elaborate mission statement, and this is quite normal now. People talk about the institutionalization uh, in, uh, of racism, but of course, and that is true up to a point, but actually what's institutionalized is anti-racism, and then people flout that in the police over and over again. But it's against the law. There's something else about London um, that's different from European countries and from the United States. Sex and marriage between people of different racial and ethnic groups is now commonplace in UK cities, and I'll come back to that. Okay, so what language do we use in order to describe the current situation? How do the terms differ? Um, so multiculturalism is often used in a very disparaging way by right-wingers, yet they've promoted it, actually, through their support of academies and faith schools. But it, it developed originally in education and local government context as a way of acknowledging cultures of minority groups. And it's a kind of reaction against the sort of assimilation model that existed when my parents first came here. I mean, they were told when they first came here that they shouldn't speak German in public places. Uh, and they tried as hard as they could to become as English as possible. Um, and, of course, that's still a model that exists in Spain, uh, in, in France. But um, multiculturalism is actually quite conservative in practice. It's oriented towards the preservation of tradition, it's not concerned with the erosion of boundaries or with cultural mixing or with modernization. Uh, and it's also, it implies a hierarchy between the majority culture and a minority culture. So it presupposes that the majority culture is the important one, majority history is important, I mean, we can see that in Michael Gove's uh, account of history, and that the minority one seems to just sort of is allowed in in the corners of the kind of broader culture. It's there for children not to feel excluded in schools. It also presupposes a homogenous culture, so that if you're Pakistani, for example, the assumption is that everybody thinks the same, that the religion is the same, that the culture, that the experiences, and so on, are somehow or other the same, when in fact they're a great deal more varied. And often, multiculturalism is defended by community leaders, and that usually means elderly men. Um, <laughs> so the voice of young women are not the voices of young women are not heard. So the main point is that the notion of multiculturalism only partially describes the current situation in the UK, and it's not much help in making sense of my family. 
So, okay, well, what is uh, superdiversity is a term that somebody called uh, Stephen Vertovich uh, introduced, and it describes something that's more complex than just multiculturalism or diversity. It says basically the population here varies not only by in terms of where people came from, but in terms of class, wealth, skills, education, uh, connectivity, immigration status, how long they've been here. I mean, there are loads of different factors that have to be taken into account. As I said before, bankers, as well as the people who clean bank, banks, live here together. So we need to have a different way of making sense of how people live together. It's not helpful to talk about multiculturalism because the world is too diverse. It's un it's, London is of unsurpassed diversity. So, okay, the notion of superdiversity then disrupts the hierarchical and homogenizing tendencies of multiculturalism. And it stresses the heterogeneity of populations. But it doesn't tell us much about how people get on with each other. It doesn't tell us about interactions, personal friendships, sexual relations, and so on. Or what people want out of their lives, or how people want and aspire to relate to others. Um, okay, cosmopolitanism. Now, uh, there are always, as with the other terms that I've been looking at, there are always different ways of understanding these things, lots of debates about it, and so on and so on. Academia is full of people debating against each other. And this is, uh, as was mentioned, this is something that I've written about, and I've written a book about it. And so my version of, I mean, classically, cosmopolitanism uh, refers to a citizen of the world, a world traveler, a person with social and intellectual appreciation of difference. But it doesn't say all that much, really, about how people get on. And one of the reasons I started working on cosmopolitanism was actually to do with Selfridges, because Gordon Selfridge was an aspiring cosmopolitan. He kept on and on about how pleased he was that London was becoming more cosmopolitan. So the kind of cosmopolitanism that I think is worth, or that we need to think about, is that it's a kind of emotional structure of feeling. It's a kind of empathetic inclusive and sometimes unconscious, sometimes conscious, identification with the other and a desire for difference and the other. So it's an intuitive sense of self as part of a common humanity with a disregard for borders. And the focus is on the allure of difference rather than the repudiation of difference. It's on anti-racism rather than racism. So unlike Multiculturalism, cosmopolitanism is about the dissolution of boundaries, and unlike superdiversity, it's about interaction. Um, so it goes beyond the normalization of difference. Okay. Um, so, all right, what's unique about London is the disposition to merge, to mix, to fall in love with people from elsewhere. And it really is unique. It's, the figures for London are much higher than anywhere in, the, in, in Europe or in the United States. And, you know, they're always contested. I mean, this sort of figure is always contested. But there's a kind of common agreement that about 60% of young male British Afro-Caribbeans are with a partner who is white or from another ethnic group. Um, women are slightly fewer women, so I've said that more than half, it's a kind of general statement. 35% um, of British Chinese marry out, 11% of Indians, and the figure uh, for people of Pakistani origin is lowest, though growing. All of these figures are growing. The phenomenon operates across the class spectrum. It includes even the Queen's cousin, who is married to a Nigerian. And in fact, according to Hello Magazine, one of the Queen's cousins uh, also has, another of the Queen's cousins also has a live-in Pakistani lover. So, um, <laughs> you know, this isn't something that happens only in certain corners of London or certain, it's really a, a, a trans-class uh, phenomenon. And finally, an astonishing 10% of children across the UK, babies born across the UK, not just in London, are born into a mixed race family. 
I mean, the category mixed is the fastest growing minority in Britain. It's incredibly high. And that e it doesn't even, you know, the census, I mean, um, uh, uh, in the first session today, um, we had some sort of census categories, and that didn't even include, I mean, there was one little line for anybody who wasn't some of the major minorities. But of course, we've got you know, there are several hundred thousand South Americans in London. There are, I think Pol Polish is the second language after English in London. So these categories are not even included in some of the figures that were developed or derived from the last census. So, and of course, if we looked at London, it would be even higher, okay? So what is mongrelization or mongrel? What is the term mongrel? Mongrelization. Well, this is what Salman Rushdie says. And Stuart Hall, who some of you are slightly less celebrated, but a very, very significant figure in my field of cultural studies, um, born in Jamaica, but one of the most influential um, academics in this field, has also referred to mongrel. It's a contentious term. Uh, it's largely, on the whole, it isn't adopted by all race theorists, particularly in the United States, because it's considered, it has a kind of long history of being quite derogatory in the States, but it seems to fit the situation, in my view, in a better way than some of the other terms. It represents the erosion of traditional racial and national boundaries on a massive scale, that on the scale that we're, we are we're experiencing it, that I've just referred to. And, you know, mongrelization describes, I mean, the situation, okay, just to go back to the situation, it's no longer about plurality or coexistence or multiculturalism or even superdiversity. What we're talking about in London is a kind of merger, indeterminacy, fusion, hybridity. It is what Salman Rushdie calls mongrelization. So I think this is a term that seems appropriate, not for all contexts, not for all groups, but it's one that's worth reviving and using in order to describe the kind of world that we live in in London these days. It points to multiple and unknown points of origin, and it points, importantly, to historical process and change. As Rushdie says, it em emphasizes impurity, and how newness enters the world. It celebrates conciliation, conjoining, and even love. So, uh, and I think, I mean, one of the terms that's currently used is mixed or mixed race. Mixed is the sort of short form of mixed race because people are very ambivalent about using the term race because of its biological connotations and history. And I mean, there are some countries in Europe that uh, won't use it at all. I mean, German academics will never use the term race. In France, Hollande uh, proposed, I don't know what's happened actually, but when he came to power, he said that he was going to make it illegal. So race is a very complicated term to sort of keep repeating. I mean, it is invoked by people of different skin colors themselves in order to, as a form of identification, to pinpoint racism and so on. But it's not necessarily the only word that we can use. All right. Um, this is my granddaughter, Kasima Nava, and uh, so this is, she's really uh, a, a Londoner. <laughs> and for those of you who can't see over there, her grandparents, her great-grandparents were Dutch, Austrian, Romanian, Afro-Mexican, indigenous Mexican, and so on and so on, and the religions were atheist, theosophist, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, and Muslim. So this is a very, very complex background. How do you kind of boil it down to a single thing? Or, you know, it isn't just one culture. It isn't just diversity. It's something much more complicated. Um, and this process seems to be unstoppable. I've done a lot of research recently into the work of race relations theorists in the 1950s. And, you know, some of the issues that came up were about what was then called half-castes, although there was debate about whether or not that was a term that should be used. But there's no way, and some of the people who were writing about race at that time were very sympathetic 
to migrants coming into the country, um, but there's no way that any of them could have imagined the situation that exists in London today. It's really a huge transformation. So really what I want to say is, who knows what London will be like 50 years from now? I mean, it may be so mixed that we can hardly distinguish one kind of background from another. Some people are really fearful of that outcome, and some people welcome it. And I, for one, am pretty proud to live in London. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>